we've looked at how the model of Slack behaves when uh, prices are fixed. Um, we saw that there was always a solution. It was unique. We looked at comparative statics, so the response of the model to uh, aggregate demand, and aggregate supply shock. Now let's look at a totally different price norm. Uh, in fact, a norm that's the um, polar opposite from the fixed price norm. Instead, let's assume that uh, prices are bargained between a seller and buyer. And we'll see that what happens under uh, bargaining is really uh, totally different. Um, <clears throat> so we'll assume that prices are bargained. Uh, so seller and buyer Uh, bargain price in uh, any <coughs> trade I. So here we're considering one specific match between a buyer and a seller. Uh, and we assume that the seller and the buyers are going to bargain the price. So there'll be a bargaining game. We need to uh, know like which solution we're going to use to solve that bargaining game. And in fact, we know that buyer and seller are in a bilateral monopoly situation, so they need to split a pie, and there are many ways to bargain over that pie, the pie being, of course, a surplus from the match between buyer and seller. Um, so we need to find a way to um, solve that bargaining uh, problem. Um, so it's very typical in the matching literature to use a Nash bargaining to solve the bargaining problem. Here we'll use something that's even a little bit simpler. Uh, we'll uh, assume a surplus sharing solution to the bargaining problem. So we'll assume a surplus sharing solution to the bargaining uh, problem uh, between buyer and seller. So what is this surplus sharing solution? So the surplus sharing solution means that uh, the buyer gets a fraction beta of the surplus and the seller gets a fraction of one minus beta of the surplus. Beta, it's a parameter between zero and one. It's a bargaining power of the buyer. And of course, one minus beta between zero and one is the bargaining power of the seller. Um, and so although this um, surplus sharing solution to um, the bargaining problem is a bit less uh, popular or less common than the Nash bargaining solution. Um, it has a very long history. Uh, so uh, this goes back at least to um, Diamond uh, 1982 paper who used a surplus sharing solution to bargaining problem. Um, and another advantage of this is of course that um, if um, buyer and seller are risk neutral, which is not the case here. Here we use um, concave utility functions, so there is no risk neutrality. But if you look at the special case with risk neutrality, uh, so in our model to obtain risk neutrality, you would need epsilon to go to infinity, uh, epsilon being the parameter of the utility function. With epsilon going to infinity, you would have a linear utility function over services and uh, real wells, and that would give you risk neutrality. Um, so if seller and buyer are risk neutral, the advantage is that uh, this, is this solution of surplus sharing is equivalent to the Nash bargaining solution. So these two solutions are the same under risk neutrality. And so that's, uh, that's a nice property of the surplus sharing property. Um, okay, so let's determine, uh, let's determine the price under, uh, that will come out in our model under surplus sharing. Uh, so for that, we need to, to uh, 
figure out what is the surplus that goes to buyer, the seller, and then we'll find the price that splits the surplus so that as giving a fraction beta to the buyer and one minus beta to the seller. Um, so from earlier work, we, we've already computed what are the surpluses that buyer and seller take away from the relationship. We had used that to show that and the total surplus from a match or any price norm is positive and the surplus that goes to the buyer and the surplus that goes to the seller is also positive. So everybody's always happy um, to um, conduct any trade uh, when they are matched. So we've already done a lot of work here that will uh, help us solve the surplus, uh, figure out what is the surplus um, sharing price. Um, so if you remember from all that work we've done, <coughs> um, we said that um, the surplus going to the seller the surplus going to the seller if price is pi so here i'm looking at uh, a trade a specific trade i between buyer and seller so the surplus going to the seller if the price is pi this we had already computed it so this we had called it uh, s for seller i because it's a trade i and this we had said was pi the price of this specific transaction divided by p this is uh, so pi this is uh, price in transaction i p this is just the aggregate uh, price so we had said that the uh, surplus going to seller i is pi over p, um, 1 over 1 plus key, epsilon minus 1 over epsilon, um, u over p, minus 1 over epsilon. And that's what we had, and you can go back um, to earlier lectures on um, trade surplus to see that. Furthermore, uh, what we had said is that um, the surplus going to the buyer i uh, is 1 over 1 plus key, epsilon minus 1 over epsilon, <coughs> key c minus 1 over epsilon minus pi over p. Uh, mu over p minus 1 over epsilon, okay? And then the total surplus for transaction i, which is just the sum of the buyer surplus plus the seller surplus. Um, here we can see that things are going to uh, clear up, um, and that's going to be 1 over 1 plus key, epsilon minus 1 over epsilon, <coughs> time key c minus 1 over epsilon. Okay, so this is a total surplus, right? So now one thing we can do is that, of course, remember um, that uh, when households um, maximize their utility, they have to be different between um, consuming services and uh, saving money and holding it as well. And this indifference condition that come from the households uh, op, you know, the household's uh, maximization problem tells us that, uh, so what we know is that uh, household's first order condition in their utility maximization problem tells us the following. And so this is always going to be um, true in the model. It tells us that uh, Right. It tells us then key C minus 1 over epsilon, which is the marginal utility from uh, services, um, is going to be equal to uh, 1 plus tau x one over one plus key no, 
sorry, uh, this is up. So it's going to be one plus tau x mu p minus one over epsilon. And this is roughly the marginal utility um, of real wealth multiplied by uh, the relative price between uh, real wealth and services, which is one plus tau x, uh, you know, the, where tau x is a matching wage. So, uh, thanks to this first order condition, we can simplify, you know, we can plug this uh, first order condition in two places. You know, we can plug it uh, here, and we can plug it here to simplify uh, our surpluses. So, once we use it, what do we get? Uh, so seller surplus, that hasn't changed, but we can find that the buyer surplus bi, that's going to be equal to uh, one over one plus key, epsilon minus one over epsilon, and then we'll have one plus tau x uh, yes, so then we'll get times mu over p minus one over epsilon, and then we'll get one plus tau x minus pi over p. <clears throat> the total surplus will get one over one plus key, epsilon minus one over epsilon, one plus tau x mu over p minus one over epsilon, and then, of course, the seller surplus, this hasn't changed, we'll get 1 over 1 plus key, epsilon minus 1 over epsilon, mu p minus 1 over epsilon, pi over p. Okay. Uh, so this is what we get. Now, the surplus sharing solution. So you see all these things are basically the same. The only difference is that here we have pi over p, here we have 1 plus tau x, and we have 1 plus tau x minus pi over p. Um, and everything in front of them, of these things, is constant. So then, imposing the surplus sharing solution, what do we get? So the surplus sharing solution is very simple. It just says that um, the seller, the buyer is going to get a share beta of the surplus, the seller is going to get a share one minus beta of the surplus. So surplus sharing imposes that the buyer, bi, get a fraction beta of the total surplus. The seller, si, gets a fraction one minus beta of the total surplus. Okay? Um, so that's what surplus sharing says. And you know, you can, these two, these two conditions are uh, of course, exactly equivalent, uh, so you can use one or the other. So the easiest is just to uh, look at uh, the buyer's condition. So we've got surplus of the buyer, um, sorry, divided by total surplus has to be equal to one minus beta. Now the surplus of the buyer, you can see once you divide it by the total surplus, here, all the terms you know, are the same. This is the same as this. This is the same as this. This is the same as this. So you get, you're just left with um, pi over p divided by um, 1 plus tau x is to be equal to 1 minus beta. So that's, that's the key condition. And so you can rewrite this. So this means that our surplus sharing price pi is going to be equal to uh, 1 minus beta times 1 plus tau x times the price, the aggregate price level uh, p. So pi is a surplus sharing price in trade i. And so, um, so what we see is that, of course, if the aggregate price level is higher, the surplus sharing price is going to move one for one with that. Uh, here, um, you can see that, of course, 
if the uh, bargaining power of the buyers is very low, say if the bargaining power of the buyer is zero, then uh, uh, then the price is going to be very high. Uh, so you can see that you know if uh, if beta equals zero, so buyers have no bargaining power. So it means that sellers have all the bargaining powers, and pi is one plus tau x. Um, time p, you can see that on the other end, if the bargaining power is 1, which means buy buyers have all the bargaining power, then the price pi is going to be equal to 0. Um, so all those things that uh, that we would expect here. So this is like the individual level uh, surplus sharing price. And now what we need to do is to see uh, once, you know, in the macroeconomy, of course, the individual price level and the aggregate price levels are related. In fact, um, if we look, you know, since we are looking at a completely symmetric model, the price in each relationship is going to be the same. So it's going to be equal to the aggregate price level. And so that's going to impose some constraint on what the tightness has to be. And then, you know, we'll have to look at the aggregate demand, the aggregate supply to figure out what aggregate price level actually satisfies that condition. Um, but um, at least at the individual level, this is the price uh, that comes out of surplus sharing in every relationship. 